you have a garden or a landscape, you're out there, you're seeing, uh, maybe you're seeing insects, maybe you're not, maybe you're seeing some damage and wondering what's causing this. And so that's kind of what we're gonna talk, talk about today. So first we'll uh, cover what Florida friendly landscaping is. We'll look at what a pest is in the landscape. Then we'll cover some common pests in the landscape. Now it's not all inclusive. I'm sure there's gonna be a pest you'd say, well, I see that one all the time, but you didn't cover it. And that definitely could happen, but we're gonna cover some of the more common pests in the landscape. Then we'll look at something called integrated pest management or IPM. And then we'll uh, finish with some tips for managing pests in the landscape. So first off with Florida Friendly Landscaping. This is a science-based education program that was developed by the University of Florida in an effort to help protect our natural resources. Through this program, we emphasize the reduced use of water, fertilizer, and pesticides, all um, while maintaining beautiful landscapes. And so the foundation of Florida-friendly landscaping and gardening in Florida is right plant, right place. When we put the right plant in the right place, plants that match the site conditions, those plants are able to thrive. They're less susceptible to pest and disease problems. Then we want to water efficiently. Certainly we know water is a precious resource, um, and so we wouldn't want to waste it. But also in regard to our plants, overwatering doesn't necessarily benefit them. And so we want to make sure that we use water in an appropriate way. Next, uh, fertilizing appropriately. Um, certainly some plants can benefit from fertilizer and using the right type at the right time of year um, can also benefit those plants. But over fertilizing or misusing fertilizer can be detrimental to both plants and the environment. Florida Friendly would encourage using mulch, a two to three inch layer of an organic or um, wood-based mulch like pine straw, pine bark, melaleuca, eucalyptus, any of those mulches um, would be great options. Attracting wildlife is another important part of Florida Friendly landscaping. Certainly we wanna provide a habitat for birds and pollinators and other wildlife. And so by creating um, habitats, habitats in our landscape, we can provide for those wildlife. We want to manage yard pests responsibly, and so that's what we'll talk about uh, today. Additionally, recycling yard waste, that's pretty easy. If you mow your lawn, you can just leave your grass clippings on the lawn, or if you have a tree that loses its leaves, instead of constantly raking those leaves up, you could just let the leaves stay and create a self-mulching area. And of course, you could compost uh, your yard waste, and that would be another way to recycle. A pretty important one is reducing stormwater runoff. And so pollution associated with stormwater runoff is a pretty big problem here in Florida. And so anytime that we can keep that water on site and let it filter into our landscapes and our lawn areas, we prevent it from running off and picking up pollutants along the way. So if you can direct your downspouts into your lawn and landscape areas, install a rain barrel, or even use a rain garden, you can reduce stormwater runoff and then prevent that pollution associated with it. And then finally, protecting the waterfront. So here in Florida, we are a peninsula, so we know three sides are surrounded by water, but even locally, we have lakes and other bodies of water, um, storm, you know, um, stormwater ponds and things. And so in an effort to manage those, Florida Friendly Landscaping would encourage you to um, create a 10-foot buffer zone, and in that zone, um, not apply fertilizer, not apply pesticide, and if possible, not to mow either. That way, we're preventing um, excess nutrients uh, from getting into the water and protecting that body of water. And so that's the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping. So now, um, moving forward, what is a landscape pest? Well, basically, it's an undesirable organism. In the landscape, it could be an insect, it could be a weed that pops up somewhere. Uh, you may have a disease on a plant. Sometimes the animals can be pests in the landscape, I think we're all pretty familiar with that. Um, and then nematodes, which are microscopic uh, roundworms, um, usually uh, they live in the soil and they can affect the roots of plants and then ultimately affect the health of the plant. But for today's purposes, we're gonna focus on pest insects and uh, bugs, if you will, in the landscape. And so here you can see um, this plant that's featured here on the right uh, if any of you are familiar with this, this is our native firebush plant. Um, it's a beautiful plant, great for uh, hummingbirds and other pollinators, butterflies love it with the beautiful orange tubular flowers. 
Um, but sometimes with the new growth on these plants, it can be kind of tender and more susceptible to some uh, minimal pest damage. Now, we'll talk about today, you know, at what point do you decide to um, take action and how much is too much? And so there you can see that's one pest problem you might encounter. So I thought as part of managing pests in the landscape, what's bugging your garden, it's important that we are able to identify some of these um, pests or insects that might be in the landscape because it's important to know what might be harmful to your plants and what might be helpful to your plants. So we're going to start with land, uh, landscape plant pests. So first up we have aphids and so you can see that picture on the right those tiny little kind of um, bright yellow uh, colored uh, pear-shaped bodied insects. So they may be winged, they may be wingless, pretty tiny, often found on new growth. So probably um, near the tips of the plant, near the top of the plant, you're going to see those. What would you notice with those? Well, first of all, you might see them all gathered together. That, that bright pop of that um, yellow or green color might stand out to you. You might also see leaves that are yellow or twisted, kind of distorted. Another thing you might notice are ants running up and down the stem of the plant or near the leaves or where the aphids are. Um, they can kind of cohabitate together and that's because the aphids secrete what's called honeydew. And so the ants actually um, help protect the aphids um, because they uh, like that honeydew. And then additionally, you might see sooty mold. And so sooty mold is a fungus that happens to grow on uh, that honeydew that is secreted from aphids and other soft body insects. So when you're out in the landscape and you're searching around, these are some clues that you might use to help you identify what's going on. The next uh, landscape plant pest you might encounter are caterpillars. Now for some this might be a pest, for others certainly not a pest, um, especially with the two examples that we have here. Um, these are both caterpillars of um, beloved butterflies. And so what you're going to see are larvae of butterflies and moths. That's what they are. And then you're going to look, you know, uh, what might you see? Well, from damage, you'll see chewing on leaves. As you can see, that picture on the left is a passion vine leaf, and it's got a gulf fritillary uh, caterpillar that's chewing on those. On the picture on the right, there's a monarch caterpillar chewing on milkweed leaf. And uh, you can see there circled, the yellow circle, that is some of the uh, frass or uh, fecal matter from the caterpillar. And so that's just an indication, even if you didn't see the caterpillars, which often they're on the under, and with most pests, you might find them on the underside of the leaf. So when you walk out and you see some type of damage, you want to scout around and these are things to look for. Now with caterpillars, um, you know, it's important to identify um, or it's pretty helpful in that most caterpillars host on a specific plant. And so that's going to help you identify if you know what the plant is, you can help identify potentially what caterpillar that is. The next plant pest we have are chinch bugs. These primarily feed on St. Augustine grass. So if you have St. Augustine, you might be familiar with these pests. They're often in stressed areas of the landscape maybe in full sun or somewhere near pavement where it's a little bit hotter, kind of that area that's a little more stress. And so we know from uh, managing landscapes, when plants are stressed, they're more susceptible to pest problems. And so that's part of the whole cycle. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the chinch bugs themselves are about a fifth inch long. They have black with white patches on their wings. And you can see that picture on the bottom. There is a chinch bug on a leaf blade. They have young nymphs that are reddish and have a white stripe across their back. And so what happens is that the turf turns yellow and dies due to the damage from the chinch bugs. So if you have St. Augustine grass, you know, it's important to identify the plant and then identify what pest may be the problem. Um, certainly with turf grass, there can be so many issues, but it helps to know what type of turf grass you have to know what it might be susceptible to. Next, we have mealy bugs. And so these may be 1 16th to 1 8th inch long. Their bodies and egg masses cover, are covered with this kind of powdery white wax, as you can see in that picture. They're just kind of um, clumps of kind of white, lumpy kind of masses. 
Um, and what they do, they attack the leaves, the twigs, and the roots of plants. Um, some other things you might look for if you're trying to identify, you may no notice sooty mold or ants. Again, a mealybug is a soft-bodied insect, and so uh, sooty mold and ants are associated with these soft-bodied insects due to the honeydew that they produce and the sooty mold that grows, there's a fungus that grows on that honeydew and the ants that want to protect those soft-bodied insects because of what they, that's uh, honeydew that they produce. So the next landscape pest we have are mole crickets. So these are kind of brown, half-inch long, velvety uh, little insects. They burrow. And so you can see that picture on the right. That's kind of the tunneling that you might see if you have uh, Bahia grass or Bermuda grass. So if you notice those tunnels, that might be a sign that you have mole crickets. Some other signs are that the turf may be spongy and kind of thinning. And you may notice three quarter inch uh, round holes in the areas as well. You can test for mole crickets with doing um, a flush with soapy water. And I forgot to mention previously with um, chinch bugs, you can also do a soap flush test as well to find out um, if you have those insects present in the lawn. Additionally, um, when you use the, the soapy water test, um, one to two tablespoons of dishwashing soap in a gallon of water, and um, you flush the area with that, and the mole crickets will surface in three to five minutes if they are present. So that's another way to just confirm that you might have this pest uh, in the landscape. But I think you'll notice as we kind of go through some of these, especially the lawn areas, many uh, lawn damage or damage to lawns may look similar. So it's important to identify, you know, what type of turf grass you have and then take the next steps to try to identify what damage you're seeing and what might be the cause. Another plant pest are mites or plant feeding mites. And so this picture on the right is pretty classic of what you might see. Um, very obvious with that kind of uh, webbing and those tiny little insects that are only 1 32nd of an inch. So very, very tiny. Um, the, the damage that you might also notice, but I think it's, it's pretty obvious when you see that kind of webbing. Um, but you may also notice kind of dull gray green leaves uh, or speckled on the leaves. So that's just something to look out for. And again, we're just talking about how to identify these pests in the landscape and you know, whether they are actually pests. Next, we have scales. So there are soft scales and then there are armored scales. So soft scales produce um, a honeydew. And again, we know with soft-bodied insects, as we've, as we've been discussing, um, when they produce that honeydew, it's often associated with that sooty mold that you can see on that picture there. It's that kind of black fungus that grows on the honeydew. And then um, oftentimes you'll see ants running around on the stems of the leaves and the branches of the leaves. So the mature scales are pretty stationary. They're not moving around a lot. But if you notice some movement, those are probably the crawlers. Um, and those are the most vulnerable life stage of a scale. And those are the easiest to control. So if you can catch it early on, have a better chance of trying to manage the problem. Um, again, there are so many different types of scale. And again, there's the, the soft scales versus the armored scale. So again, when you see these other signs, particularly if you see sooty mold or ants on the plant, you might be able to identify that, hey, maybe I have a soft bodied insect. And then you can narrow it down from there by looking on the underside of leaves or sometimes on the top of leaves, you may see um, these different insects. Sod webworm is another um, lawn pest that you might notice. And so um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the, this is the third lawn photo um, that we've shown. Uh, you can see that there in the bottom middle. And so what are we noticing? We're noticing kind of um, brown spots in the lawn. And so again, I think it's important to identify what type of grass we have and then start to investigate what might be causing this. It could be a pest, but it may not be a pest. And so that's important to remember. Um, there's lots of other causes, uh, you know, that might uh, contribute to this damage in the lawn. And so certainly pests can be a problem, but maybe um, practices that we're using, overwatering, underwatering, things like that may be also contributing. So sod webworms are gray-green caterpillars 
with brown spots on uh, the segments of their body, and they're about a three quarters of an inch length. They're most active from spring to fall. So again, there's another clue and we're kind of investigating what time of year is it? What, you know, is this when uh, this particular pest might be active? And the caterpillars uh, or these sod web worms prefer dry, hot grass areas. So again, here's a spot in the lawn that might be kind of stressed. And so we know when plants are stressed, again, more susceptible to pests. Now, sod webworms feed at night. So during the daytime, they're hidden and you wouldn't really see them. But at nighttime, they're out there feeding. And so you can see um, that picture on the bottom left. That's what the early stage of the sod webworm kind of does this window feeding, they call it. And so the damage isn't super obvious and, and not as bad as it can get. You might, you know, they kind of do that kind of rasping, scraping, uh, chewing on just the top part of the, the leaf. But then over time, as they grow, they can devour um, the grass as well. And so that picture on the bottom right you can see is the adult um, webworm or the, the moth of the webworm. And so uh, there's a picture on the top right. You can see one of the, the young stages of the webworm. And so it's important to notice all of these different um, life stages and um, characteristics of damage that we might notice in the lawn. Next we have thrips. And so thrip, thrips are pretty tiny as well. So it's not going to be obvious the insects themselves, but their damage is what you will notice. And so what are you going to see? Um, the leaves are going to be curled or distorted. The flowers might have some brown. And so you can see on these pictures uh, the bottom right is a rose with kind of the browning of the flower, and so that's damage from a thrip. There's a pepper plant on the bottom left, and so you can kind of see the distorted curling, um, the dulling of the leaves, and that's um, damage from a thrip as well. And there on the top is another leaf with uh, more obvious is that gray kind of discoloration um, in the way that the thrips feed and how they damage the leaves. So. If you're seeing this in the landscape, you know, that's a pretty tiny insect to try to identify, but knowing the plant and knowing the damage would help you identify what pest you might be dealing with. And before we could do any type of management, we would certainly need to identify the plant and the pest. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the last uh, plant pest that we'll talk about today are white flies. And the adults look like tiny little white moths. They're about one tenth of an inch. You may have noticed these if you've gone up to a plant and kind of disturbed the leaves and you've got kind of these tiny little white flies, if you will, flying around everywhere, potentially you have white flies. Um, the nymphs are what feed on the plants. They're small, kind of transparent to greenish in color. They might look like scales as well. But when you see those kind of uh, white tiny moths flying around, that's going to be an indication that you have white flies. Additionally, they're on the underside of the leaves. So it's important, you know, if you see the adults kind of fluttering around, maybe turn the leaf over and see what else is there. Additionally, white flies are a soft bodied insect. And so they're associated with sooty mold that grows on that honeydew that they secrete and ants that um, help protect those soft bodied insects because of that honeydew beneficial bugs that we might see as well. And there's so many of those. Oftentimes we think there's more pests in the landscape, but there's so many more beneficial insects. Um, and those range from bees, big-eyed bugs, green link spiders, um, there's wasps, sink bugs, praying mantids, all kinds of things that are beneficial. And some of them may even be um, enemies or predators of some of these pests um, in the landscape. And so that's what we'll take a look at next because it's important to identify what pests we're seeing. But then, you know, when we're out there, you may also see some of the beneficial bugs and they might be helping with some of the pest problems. So before we take action, you know, if you're seeing the beneficial bugs, you might want to stop and take a moment before you um, take any action. And so let's take a look at um, a few beneficial insects that are also going to act as natural enemies for some of the pests that we've just discussed. 
So here you can see lady beetles or ladybugs, many people call them, They're, they are a beetle. Um, and so these tiny beetles are pretty uh, beneficial. Lady beetles feed on aphids, mealybugs, mites, scales, and white flies. So that's quite a few of the pests that we talked about today. So if we see this beneficial bug or natural enemy, it's important that we don't take action or try to protect that. The picture on the right there, um, you can see that thumbnail, that's what the larval stage of the ladybug looks like. And so if you see those on a plant, it's important not to take action as well. And so with many insects, just like with butterflies, they go through metamorphosis or they change throughout their life stages. And so the adult may look very different from the young stage. Um, and that's very true for lady beetles. And there's so many different types of lady beetles. Um, this is just one type, but you can see um, the enlarged picture there of the larvae. Um, but in, in actuality, you can see kind of how tiny it may be at one point. So pretty tiny but these are very important in the landscape as they're gonna help us with some of these pest insects. Next, we have lacewing, uh, can both the green lacewing and the brown lacewing. And so there's kind of an enlarged picture on the left of the green lacewing, but maybe you've noticed in the landscape, maybe on a plant or even on some structure in your yard I've seen before, um, or you know, uh, something, what they do is the eggs that's the eggs there on the leaf. And so they're attached to those filaments to help to protect them from predators. So if you see those in the landscape, it might be kind of alarming thinking, well, there's a lot of something right here. I need to get rid of that, but this is a beneficial insect. And we, so, so we want to try to protect it because it's going to help with our harmful pests. That picture in the bottom middle is a brown lacewing and it's feeding on, and that's a, a larvae of a brown lacewing and it's feeding on aphids. Um, pretty enlarged picture there. You can see the little hair-shaped bodies of the aphids. And that brown lacewing is helping, um, you know, is eating the aphids and therefore reducing that pest population on this plant. So I hope what you're picking up is that, um, yes, we have lots of pest um, insects in the landscape, but we also have many beneficial insects. And it's important to identify the different stages as we want those um, eggs and larvae to grow up and continue that um, beneficial life cycle. Parasitic wasps are another beneficial insect in the landscape. And so you can see um, that there's one type of, there's so many different types of parasitic wasps, but there's just one type there. And you can see that picture on the right is where they have uh, encased a tobacco hornworm. And so they have parasitized uh, the, the wasp parasitized that, um, that hornworm or that caterpillar, and now the larvae um, are starting to emerge. So there's just another instance of a beneficial insect in the landscape that's helping to take care of a pest problem. Big-eyed bugs. So we talked about chinch bugs earlier, right? And, and several of you in the poll mentioned that you, you have uh, chinch bugs in the landscape. Well, it turns out that big-eyed bugs particularly this one on the right, um, is a predator of southern chinch bugs. So that's important to know that even, you know, in your lawn, we have um, natural enemies and predator insects that can also help. That big-eyed bug on the right there, you can see, is feeding on whitefly nymphs. So another pest that it's helping to um, eliminate or reduce the population of. Minute pirate bugs are another beneficial insect in the landscape. They're also known as insidious flower bugs. And so in this picture, you can see they're feeding on uh, thrip larvae. And so they are a natural enemy of thrips in the landscape. So again, we've covered, uh, by looking at these natural enemies, we've covered several um, pests that we discussed earlier that um, these natural enemies can help reduce populations of. So, so we've gone through different pests. We've gone through beneficial insects and harmful insects. And now we're gonna look at integrated pest management or IPM. And you may have heard of this strategy. And so it's a way to, a way an approach of managing our landscapes. And it involves many steps, but instead of just two steps of seeing an insect or some type of bug 
And then step two is trying to use a chemical to spray for that. We use a more um, wholesome approach, uh, many steps. And so the first step is identifying what that pest might be, what that insect might be. Maybe it's not a pest, just again, you know, as we saw with all of these natural enemies, they cohabitate with these pests. And so they are often found together. And so we want to identify which ones are the problem and which ones are um, helping us. So first step is identification. Then we want to monitor the situation. And so we want to see, you know, get out there, scout, inspect the landscape. You know, how is this progressing? You know, have you noticed any beneficial insects um, near some of these pests? Has the problem kind of uh, dwindled down? Is it not a huge problem? Has the problem kind of expanded to a point where now you're concerned and you feel like you need to take action? And so then you would do, uh, you know, have to make a decision. And so what level of infestation or damage do you need to just take an action to make, you know, a difference or stop this from progressing? And so that can be kind of the hardest step is at what point do you make that decision? And then if you decide you need to take action, what are you going to do? Within integrated pest management, um, there's four types of, of actions or controls that we can use. So we can use cultural controls. You know, how is this plant being maintained? Again, is it like some of those lawn, um, lawn areas that we saw that were under stress? And so they're more susceptible to pests. Do we need to change how we're maintaining that landscape or that lawn so that it's less susceptible and that it's healthier um, and won't be bothered by these pests anymore. Then you might have mechanical control. So potentially um, we could just prune off if it's a plant part and it's not a big deal, but we know that potentially if we don't take action, you know, maybe this could go further. So we could just prune off part of the plant. We could just pick off the insect as well. Um, you know, thinking about weeds, uh, well, that's not what we're talking about today, but just an example for mechanical control, you know, you might um, mow weeds in the lawn um, before the flowers go to seed to try to prevent that weed um, from growing any further or um, propagating in the landscape. Another control option is biological control. So all of these natural enemies that we just talked about are an option for helping um, manage. So there's um, natural enemy pests. There might be um, other types of uh, natural fungus or um, other types of biological control that might help maybe a bacteria or something. Um, when we think about um, caterpillars and ones that um, might be considered pests and using Bt as an option. And then um, oh, the last option would be chemical control. And so, you know, is it time to, to use some type of spray or chemical method to control this pest. And so again, we would encourage you to use the least toxic method. Um, and certainly with all of these different control methods, you might wanna use some type of rotation, um, especially with chemicals and not constantly use the same one because that's where we can develop resistance. And so this product that may have worked in the past no longer works after a certain period because we've just constantly overused it and now this pest has developed resistance to that product. And then finally with evaluation, you want to assess this, you know, the methods that you've used. Was it successful? Were there areas for improvement? Was there something that you needed to change? And so that's integrated pest management, kind of a multi-step process of identifying, monitoring, scouting, deciding um, if action is needed, what is the best action, and then reviewing that. So here's some other tips for scouting uh, your landscape or garden. You want to examine, look at your plants from top to bottom. We talked about with some of these pests, um, they're more, um, they like the, the new young tender growth of plants. So you might look at the tops of the plant, look to the new leaves. You might also need to look under the leaves um, and even at the base of the plant for problems. Additionally, we um, certainly need some type of uh, tolerance in the landscape. And so most plants can tolerate up to 20%, um, losing 20% of their leaves without affecting, um, you know, flowering or fruiting. And so it's important to have some type of tolerance with pests in the landscape. 
certainly we don't want to panic just because we see one insect or we see a little bit of damage. Um, we don't need to overreact. Certainly it's great that you saw that. That means you were out there, you were scouting. Um, maybe it was by accident, maybe it was on purpose, but at least you saw it and so you can monitor that. Additionally, we want to learn to identify what's in the landscape. Um, again, learning these beneficial insects is so important because when we see those present, um, we can know that hopefully they're helping to control the situation. Certainly monitor as you see signs of damage, just keep an eye on it and then decide if you need to take action. And keeping a journal is pretty important as well. You know, do certain times of the year, certain weather patterns, um, do certain pests, problems show up in the landscape. And so by having that documentation, you can look back and say, yep, I saw that. You know, even with your phone, just taking a picture of a pest, you can always scroll back and say, yep, January of last year, I saw the same thing. And just know that maybe it's a seasonal pest and it's not a big deal. Some more steps. Certainly, um, you want to manage gardens and landscapes properly with uh, proper watering, scouting, um, you know, keeping plants healthy. And then with the control methods, again, um, I know I've said it several times, but identifying those beneficial insects is so important. Um, you might also look at some natural, natural products, and we'll have a list of all of these links um, with the survey when we send that out to you. And then if you do decide to use some type of chemical control, always follow the label. Only apply it if you really need to. Um, and certainly, uh, we want to protect pollinators in the landscape. So be cautious if they're out, that's not the time to spray. So maybe later in the day when they're not as active is a better time. And certainly if it's windy, we don't wanna spray because that's just gonna blow that product further away and maybe hit a non-target um, organism. Some examples of uh, lower toxicity pest control might include BT. And so that's a bacteria or uh, caterpillars. And so it disrupts their, um, their kind of stomach system. And so that's a natural product. Certainly you can use insecticidal soaps for scale and aphids, some of those soft bodied insects. Remember, you can always hand pick um, you know, insects that you might see that aren't out of control. Um, certainly a stream of water can be very beneficial as well. Um, a lot of times with some of the, the aphids that you might see, a strong stream of water will help dislodge those from the plant. And that's all you had to do. You didn't have to do much else. And just remember, if you do apply pesticide, the label is the law, and so you must abide by um, the instructions and personal protection equipment that's listed on that label. So some tips for avoiding pest problems in the landscape. Think before you plant. Again, that goes back to right plant, right place. If we <clears throat> match plants to site conditions, they're gonna be able to thrive, less susceptible to pest problems. <clears throat> Certainly we wanna start with pest-free or pest-resistant plants. So that's gonna give these plants a much better start. Excuse me. <clears throat> Keep your plants healthy, water appropriately, fertilize appropriately. Certainly overwatering and over fertilizing can stress plants out as well. And then you wanna scout regularly. So get out in the landscape and monitor. With uh, turf grasses, it's important to mow at the proper height and with plants to only prune as necessary <clears throat> as over pruning can cause insect problems as well. And then of course, we wanna protect our beneficial insects. So I would say, let's look at some slides and try to identify or learn about, you know, what some problems in the landscape might be. So here's something you might see. If you notice, we're seeing that sooty mold, that, that fungus that's growing on what we've learned um, was associated with soft bodied insects and the honeydew that they produce. So would say that's step one. So we go out in the landscape, we see this on a plant. I would say another important step is identify what this plant is. And so while it may be hard because, you know, if I sent you this picture, you might say, I'm not sure, although maybe you, you would know. Um, certainly that leaf is a little familiar in that um, it has kind of a puckering. And so that's our native wild coffee plant. Um, and so it's important uh, 
um, to identify that. Even if you don't know and you're seeking help, it's important to send multiple pictures of different parts of the plant, include, you know, maybe a ruler or your hand in the picture to give some type of um, reference to size so it's um, easy to identify what that plant might be. So we know we have um, this native plant, uh, wild coffee. We know that we're seeing sooty mold growing on it, so we can suspect that there's some type of soft-bodied insect associated with this. So then I would say, let's do a little more investigating. And so here, upon closer inspection, um, a couple things pointed out what we're seeing. Um, you can see there on the bottom right, the circle, there are leaves that are kind of distorted or stippled. And so that's a sign, um, you know, maybe of an aphid or a thrip of some sort. And then while we're looking at that, we might also see a beneficial insect. And so you can see there in the middle, that's the twice stabbed lady beetle. So we have a beneficial insect that is present. Now, um, it's important to monitor this situation now that we've identified the pest and um, a beneficial insect. And so certainly we would wanna look under the leaves of this plant. Um, I didn't include, but there were other photos or when um, inspecting it, it also had ants. And so just another sign that there was some type of soft bodied insect present. Have you ever seen this before? These leaves with kind of these almost perfect notches cut out. Um, I would say it's kind of the cutest damage to a leaf I've ever seen. Um, and if you know, you've seen this damage before and been alarmed, I would say not to worry. This is caused by uh, leaf cutting bees. And so they cut these parts of the leaf out and then they use those leaf pieces to construct a nest um, for their uh, larvae. And so if you see this damage, know that this pest is not gonna devour your plant. Um, and this bee, certainly while it might be considered a pest that it cut a few notches out of your plant is really not a problem. And so I would say at this point, there's really no action that would need to be taken. And then the final one, here you might see um, a plant or a leaf here we have on the left and we see a little bit of chewing. You might also, um, it might be a little hard to see, but you can see that leaf is also um, in the kind of the middle of it on the left is a little bit folded over. So I think we definitely need to take a closer look and see what is going on. If we turn the leaf over, we find this um, bean leaf roller. So this little um, guy has been chewing on this leaf. And so we might say, well, how much damage has it caused? Because remember, plants can tolerate um, a fair amount of damage without really affecting production, affect flowering, affect fruiting, um, if it's you know, a plant that we're looking, uh, maybe an edible plant. But another thing to consider is what is this um, a caterpillar of? And so this is the long-tailed skipper. So while this may be a pest of your edible bean plants, this skipper is also considered a pollinator and you can see it um, perched here on a rosin leaf flower um, in the garden helping to pollinate. So I think there's multiple things we need to think about and um, you know some perspective on what a pest might be. So those were just some examples. Certainly um, it wasn't all inclusive but I think or I hope you took home the point of it's important that we identify what are we dealing with? What are the common pest plant, uh, plant pests? What are some common beneficial insects that will help us manage those pests in the landscape? 